dessert, I want to go ahead and make a few announcements and then we'll introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, have we made any progress on the trivia? Okay. I'll go through the answers real quick. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Providence Memorial Chapel was built in 66. First class graduated was in 1895. Today's luncheon marks the 116th. How many presidents have served? 12. Who were the old cats? No, they were the group before the Lady Oaks. They were the Oaks was the basketball team. Oh. Okay, what uh, alum was served under which president? Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, you're right. In fact, one of the sweaters on the bears back in the meet and greet room is, belongs to that alumnus. He was the class of 1938. Oh, wow. Many of you remember Mildred Bond. Do you remember what she was? Housekeeping. Housekeeping, head of housekeeping. But I almost think she could have been all of the above. In the early years, what do we do to help students earn their way to their school? All of the above. We had dairy farming, we had orchards, we had a fountain pit factory. In fact, we have two of those pins on display in Cochran Hall, if you have a chance to go over there. Greenhouses. How many alumni have we had inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame? Five. The Student Memorial Gymnasium, also known as the Cow Palace, was destroyed by fire in 86. In 1995, we became Oakland City University. Anybody remember the class here that's engraved on the entrance in the archway? Class of 1922. The total number of alumni on our mailing list this does not include the ones we can't find. <laughs> the ones that don't want to be on our list. <laughs> It's 9,740. Total number of play alumni paying dues in the year, fiscal year 2018 was 256. So for all of you that have supported the alumni association with your dues, I truly thank you. So anybody have more than 10, correct? <laughs> mm, skipped a lot of classes, did you? <laughs> Anybody have five, correct? Mm. Well, 69 class had eight. Good for you guys. Okay, I want to do a couple of thank yous here. I want to thank the Pioneer Catering. College Catering for our meal today. They do an excellent job for us all through the year, and I always appreciate it. <laughs> want to thank Eric Murphy, our IT guru, for helping us set up everything. He was a lifesaver this week. Maintenance and housekeeping also play a big role in making one of these events. Happen. We had housekeeping here early this morning, sweeping for us, so that was great. Also, want to thank uh, we have a new member on our team. Can you please stand, Megan. Megan's been, with us. <laughs> Megan's been with us about three weeks now, and, and we are delighted to have her. She's a huge asset to our office. I need to tell you about is the alumni directory that we do every five years is in production. You'll soon be getting emails, postcards, and those kinds of things to help you, to help us get the, all the information correct. This is our best way of getting up-to-date information on our alumni. 
and this is the only way we really keep our database up to, up to date as well as we do. Um, just want to make sure that when you get the email or the postcard that you answer them because if, the, if you contact them and it's at your convenience and they're getting the information directly from you so there's less chance of errors being made. There's absolutely no obligation to buy anything when they call you. This company does alumni directories for thousands of schools. Also, along with that, if you do have a change of name, change of address, change of phone number, email, anything to make it more difficult for us to get in touch with you, please let us know. Give me a call, send us an email. There's also a form at, on our website where you can update your information. If you've had a chance to look at your program, you'll know that our guest speaker today has had a successful career as an educator, researcher, and author. He and his wife, Roxanne, a professor of English, have collaborated on many projects. They are definitely jewels of our campus. Please join me in welcoming distinguished professor, Dr. Randy Mills, class of 1973, to the podium to share his wit and wisdom about the early years of Oakland City University. Uh, that story had never never been told. Uh, 
So one of the things I found out when I started doing work on Melba Phillips is that what was out there in the, in the research and in the writing didn't say much about Oakland City. Uh, what it did say was it wasn't a very good school, uh, it wasn't very helpful for her, and, and it just, she found a way somehow in spite of the place. So I started looking through the, the documents, uh, yearbooks, uh, grades, all sorts of things, to try to recreate what happened to her here. And even found her own words in some uh, things that she wrote where that wasn't the case. And in fact, she talked about this place being a turning point in her life, that it nourished her and brought her to all the honors that she would get. Let me, that she would receive. Let me, well, Southern Illinois get, <laughs> get there. So I guess they didn't take all of it out of the year. Margaret Irwin. <laughs> um, a little information about Melba Phillips. In 2004, every national newspaper carried a detailed obituary of Indiana physicist Melba Phillips, who died at the age of 97 in the Petersburg, Indiana nursing home. Her, her obituary in national newspapers reminded the general public of her amazing life journey and of her many contributions to science. <coughs> Melba was an important participant in what has been called a, a heroic age of physics, a time when scientists were just beginning to study quantum theory and other areas of physics that would bring the world into the atomic age. Her many research collaborators included some of the greatest physics, uh, physicists of that time. Her best friends, her buddies that she ran around with were all Nobel um, prize winners in chemistry and physics and quantum science and, and things of that nature. So she lived in very rare air. Most of all, the newspaper pieces noted that Melba Phillips was a woman pioneer, courageously blazing a tra trail for other women scientists. In 1983, the American Association of Physics Teachers recognized Melba's work in education by creating the Melba Phillips Award, a national honor given yearly to the individual who is judged to have made uh, an exceptional contribution to physics education. So I'm going to tell you uh, a story about two historical entities. One is Melba Phillips and the other is Oakland City College and the interaction. And again, the theme is that this kind of thing that happens to Melba happened to me and happened to you and everybody that, that, that comes to this place, that, that there's a change agent, no matter uh, how backward you might have been in, in my case, or how smart you might have been in Melba's case, uh, the experience here made the difference. Uh, Melba came here in the 1920s, so I, I want to I want to go back just a little bit because when I write about people, I also write about places, and what I've discovered in writing history is that places have a, an existence to them. They have a character. So when you start writing about people and places, you realize that. You realize how the place itself is impacting on people and vice versa. So Oakland City College started out as a dream in the 1840s with the General Baptist denomination. They wanted a college like other denominations had. And so there were many attempts uh, in the 1840s. There was one down in Western Kentucky. Uh, there was one in, in Evansville in the 1870s. There was one in uh, the 1860s here that was successful until the people who, who had funded the college, uh, the, the father died, that was James Cochran, and then it, uh, it collapsed. And then in 1885, the college finally took root here in Oakland City and, and started its life. Uh, historically, Oakland City College was perceived to have to be filling a void in uh, this intellectual void that you had in Southwest Indiana. There were no colleges here uh, of any sort during that time. And that was the initial uh, vision of the college, to give people what was called a classic or classical education and also prepare them for the business world and teaching and ministry. So when Melba arrived in the uh, 1920s, and I I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about her youth because now we're going to talk about what she brought to the table and what was impacting her life. 
A lot of people don't realize this, but the Great Depression started in this area in right after World War I, 1920. Uh, the, uh, the need for, for uh, foodstuffs for the war and coal and so forth that just disappeared. And so this area was, was mining and agriculture. So we started seeing poverty here in the 1920s uh, on into the uh, 30s when the Great Depression hit the rest of the nation. So Melba Phillips, who grew up in Pike County, uh, grew up in a farming family. She grew up in a culture where the only opportunity for a woman, if she was going to do something professional, was teaching. And so she knew she was going to be a teacher. Uh, she wanted to be a teacher. She just had to decide what she wanted to teach. She was interested in math. She was interested in English. She was interested in history. She, she would have these uh, different things that she would want to do. Uh, I found a, a copy of her uh, uh, a little journal that she kept when she was in high school. And she was always trying to figure out, she was especially interested in geometry. So there, I think there's three things that have not been resolved in squaring the circles one. I can't remember because I now there's other professors turning in their graves. <laughs> so I forgot that as well. Uh, but she was always doodling uh, and writing down those kinds of things and trying to solve these problems that they had been able to solve. So that was the kind of person that she was. Um, it didn't help that she was a prodigy. I don't think anybody understood just how smart she was. She didn't understand how smart she was. So she came to Oakland City because it was close and because they didn't have a lot of money. This was the only thing available to her. And like most of us in this room, she came from a rural area where one didn't hear a lot of intellectual discussion, even though her family were, they were an exception to that rule. They were very intellectual and uh, uh, very aware and sophisticated uh, about the world. So she came here, and the story is that there wasn't anything here for her. Here's, here's a part of an interview that probably caused historians to believe this. So she's writing this about coming to Oakland City. She wanted to be, be a physics uh, major. There was no physic physics major at Oakland City College, and it was very easy for me to know more about physics than anybody else in the college. I took two physics courses. There was no way of becoming a physics major at that college, but I'd fallen in love with physics in high school and managed to get it in college uh, through courses, uh, one given only occasionally. The professor, and that was uh, Professor Oxford, not uh, her beloved uh, Professor Jordan, advised me strongly against taking it, not because I was the only girl, but because I was the only freshman who wanted to enroll. Uh, so she learned, according to this, she learned what she learned in physics from the textbooks that they, they bought her. They just didn't have the background in that. Now, one of the things that historians really love is finding things that have been said that aren't true and pointing it out. And so one of the things that I found going through the archives and the official records was that uh, uh, Melba's memory was not quite right. She said she was only able to take two classes. The records showed her taking at least four physics courses and receiving an A in all of them. So that was interesting. These courses included studies in the areas of mechanics and sound, heat and light, and magnetism and electricity. Uh, in an interview many years later, May Melba also related, and this is the key to the turning point in her life. I don't remember a lot of the, of the things that I was taught in class. My son was asking me about biology. What do you remember about biology? I don't remember anything about biology. And I think, how could that be? How can I go in those classes in math and math and not know those things? Of course, I know the things I ended up teaching and I love. But you know what made the difference? It was the professors. It, were, it was the people in the offices helping us. When I was a freshman, we had quarters, and I had a president's scholarship. Forget Terry, I'm talking about this. And I had to keep a B average. And so I've never been away from home. I had a miserable first two quarters. I had to make all A's, 18 hours of A, to keep my scholarship. Staring in Vietnam too. You lose your scholarship, get drafted. And they would check every 
uh, at the time. And so there was an English teacher who had given me, he told me, he called me in and he said, you're, you're not going to pass the class, you need to get out of here so you won't lose money. I said, i got to have 18 hours a day. And I said, what did I do wrong? And he told me that I made a mistake in, in uh, signing, that's all. And I said, well, I can't do that. So, so I'm, I'm, i got to have a day on the stage. He said, you heard me. And I said, well, you heard me. <laughs> Later on, that spring, he was with another teacher who really appreciated me, mentored me, cared about me. And so Mr. Sublet tells me to come up and he says, oh, do you know so-and-so? So so-and-so. And I just looked down at the ground because, yeah, I know so-and-so. And he was a so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Sublet said, he's the best student I ever had in history. Did you believe that? A guy from Southern Illinois. And we both looked down again. So I go home, summer, work in the hay fields. I'm at that mailbox every day because I don't know what I'm going to do when I get those grades, but I don't want mom and dad to see it. Five, they come in. I open the letter. And that man gave me an A. You know why he gave me an A? Because Roger Sublette acknowledged me and affirmed me. And that's always stuck with me as a teacher, that lesson to be careful with students in those kinds of ways. Melba Phillips had that kind of teacher, and his name was William uh, Dr. Jordan. Was it William? Was that yes. the son? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. So here's what she says about Dr. Jordan or Professor Jordan. I must have seen just a kid, but they but if they minded my making A's in the courses, I was not aware of it. And in math, there was no trouble at all. Plenty of girls, some of them making A's. And truly, and this was put in quotation marks by her, and truly a great math professor. The standards were high, and what we learned, we really learned. And that was going on in 1969 through 1973, too. To successive generations of students in the Little Baptist College in Oakland City, Indiana, Professor William Jordan was a source of strength and inspiration well beyond the uh, mathematics he taught. And Melba would often speak of her great debt, Professor Jordan, who served as a model. Later on, she said, for her own teaching. Of course, remember, the award she's remembered for is teaching. She wrote a lot of textbooks about teaching physics, and her motto was, was Professor Jordan. Uh, it's interesting to me, when I started looking through the, uh, the records to see what her life was like here at Oakland City, uh, I saw something else. And, and one of the things I want to say real quickly was that one of the legends that you see about her is that she made straight A's at this place. She did not. Um, I probably broke some purple laws, but I looked up her grades. And she got, uh, oh, uh, she had several B grades. Uh, a B grade in college math, of all things. A B grade in one of her science biology classes, and a B in physical education. Now, that's understandable. In the, and in her principal of high school teaching class. Now, I wondered, because I saw when she was taking those, she came like me. Maybe she did, had the experience I had. You know, she hadn't been away from home when she got here. And I did see where she was going all over the place. You know, the, the college paper talked about all the places, the different places she would go to, and she would take car trips, and she was always going all over the place. So. Perhaps like me too, she uh, she had her down a uh, quarter there to have to make up for. So she got to OCC and she eventually became the senior editor of the yearbook. She got into acting. She was on the debating team. She was president of the, of the literary society. She played the violin, in the college orchestra, and she wrote these really odd and interesting <coughs> articles in the paper and spoke at the chapel about geometry and life. I don't understand. Them. But she thought they made a lot of sense, I guess. And, uh, well, here, here, I'll read you one. Would you like to hear one of the things she wrote? Yeah. Um, I'm, I need to tell you that it's a, it is a strange and wonderful thing how minds, how these minds of ours work. You know it. I need not suggest the processes of thinking are built up by trains of thought that move through the realms of spirit with lightning rap. Uh, Rapidity, rapidity, and that certain lines of thought will call it strange and varied experiences which you thought were dead. As an illustration of this common thing that we all experience every day, let me tell you how I happen to select a unique 
this unique subject, squaring the circle. She just couldn't let that one go. Well, she was kind of like me when I was young, but she was at church thinking about something else. I went to church the other night and listened to a fairly good sermon. The speaker opened his talk by showing us that knowledge was acquired by passing from the known to the unknown through a series of logical steps. It's not the sermons I heard. <laughs> Sometimes these steps are well outlined in our minds. Other times they are jumbled into one big heap with bridges, the, the space between our past known thoughts and the unknown ideas which grow out of them. I like the idea of building new structures of old out of stone, and it struck me that this is a possible explanation for my liking geometry so well in high school. From the known to the unknown, oftentimes was a mere step, and again, many and difficult ones. Sometimes we cannot arrive at the unknown because of lack of data or method, and that goes on. Uh, while I leave that, I want to come up to uh, another really interesting thing. I'm going to tell you here just a little bit about uh, Melba could be very aggressive if she thought somebody wasn't doing their job. And so she went after a professor who wasn't doing his job. That was kind of came out in the notes. But I wanted to look at some of the pictures up here. I want, I want you to see the world. And this is a world some of you are going to remember. Uh, hit the ones, just uh, go through. So there's the well house. These were, were, were from a year book where Melba would have been here and what she would have seen when she was here. There's the well house. There's the gym. Yeah, the old gym. <laughs> yeah, it's changed over the years, hasn't it? <laughs> Wheatley Hall, did she stay? Wheatley Hall got very close to uh, uh, Wheatley. <laughs> Want to hit some of those other spots in? That, that's another one that's not in color. Those color ones were nice. Do you have that one without the wood? Yeah, isn't that a nice one? That, you see the well house in the back? And uh, there's some people walking down the path to Wheatley Hall. And uh, I walked that path many times. <laughs> Where was I going? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will get to that at the end, Roxette. Do you want to go to some of those pictures in the yearbook of Melbourne? Uh, I think that's where she's editor of the, uh, of the yearbook. That's her there. That's her. No, that's your, yeah, that's, that's your senior year. Another one there. That's an advertisement. Uh, Melba thought that she was going to get a degree here and go teach math in my county. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Become the most famous woman physicist in, in I don't, what, what did I think I was going to do? Go back to Southern Illinois? Teach in grade school? Well, how about that? Uh, oh, there's uh, Professor Jordan at the top. And the guy below is Professor uh, Oxford. I think he was killed in a, in a uh, train uh, accident shortly after that there uh, on uh, Franklin Street, walking toward the, uh, what had been the uh, agricultural school at the time. Uh, she, she was okay with him. He, he was, I think he was kind of a big wig in the denomination. He wasn't quite in the bad. But uh, Professor Jordan was, was, the, was the real deal. You know, it only takes one to give it that sort of thing. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some of those at the end when she gets her degree. I want to tell you about this, this business when she got into, uh, into it with a professor. Um, One of her professors, the head of the history department, taught in a very poor manner that greatly disturbed Melba. Her anger with the professor primarily concerned the professors being late to class, yelling at students, often looking dis disheveled, and being unprepared. Phillips' strong feeling about the professor's incompetence exploded in a collegiate article where, in so many words, she called him a balding ass. <laughs> now, she did it in a scientific, I had to look up some stuff to see what she was saying about the guy, but that's what she was calling it. It's pretty sharp, wasn't she? I, I should take geometry so I could look at it, I guess. Phillips also made bitter fun of her instructor in both the joke section and the calendar events section of the 1926 yearbook, a yearbook on which she served as editor. In the calendar of events section, she wrote things like, I'm going to call him Professor X, Professor X dismissed political science class early again. 
Professor X was 11 minutes late. Where, oh, where is my Greek history class gone? This ongoing criticism against the OCC professor, professor placed in a mere yearbook, um, uh, it led the staff to being labeled antagonist, and the yearbook was outlawed for a while, and then there was a compromise made. I don't know what they took out, but what was in there was pretty interesting. Uh, and the next year, that professor was not back. So she could make things happen. Um, two other stories, actually two stories quickly about, uh, uh, they call them Pop, Pop Jordan. In the 1920s, Oakland City College had a football team, and our big rivalry was Evansville. And we beat them in the homecoming game. So the next day, uh, and I think this was in, yeah, it was in the collegiate, the next day, Melba went to class. He wasn't much of a sports person. And nobody would talk about uh, math, and she, anal analytical math. And she was all upset, you know, and, and uh, Jordan wouldn't talk about it. And so finally, uh, Jordan says, well, let's just talk about the football game. And so uh, he said, I want you to pick somebody here, the, the hero of the game, the guy that scored the winning uh, touchdown was there. And I think Jordan was trying to help him. He, he really got involved in her life to try to help her grow socially. So she wasn't much with boys, and so he, he said, I'm going to pick somebody to go downtown. We're going to put in our money, and we're going to buy him a Stetson hat for being the hero of the game. And he picked Melba to go downtown and take him downtown to buy that hat. In another experiment that he did, according to the paper, there was kind of some infighting between different uh, uh, cliques of girls. Well, that's been going on forever. <laughs> and Melba belonged, let's see, which group was she in? Uh, Jordan uh, got the sociology professor to do this experiment uh, where they divided the girls into groups. The funny gang, the serious-minded and studious gang, the dignity and all it's worth gang, and the young and frivolous gang. And so Melba was in the dignity and all it's worth gang. So they took them out uh, in Jordan's car to a fancy restaurant and they, they all mingled and talked and everything, and then they kind of did a poll to see how everything worked out. And uh, one of the comments was, Melba Phillips um, could hardly hold her, uh, uh, her laughing. I guess she got really tickled and enjoyed it. And uh, it was considered a very successful kind of experiment. So Melba Phillips graduates. All she knows about physics is what she's read. She has no point of reference of knowing where she's at. She starts teaching in Pike County in a little school, and she goes to a, a, a teacher's meeting, and there's a, a guy recruiting students for graduate school from Kalamazoo College in Michigan. It's a defunct school now, it's a Baptist school. And she got a, a scholarship there. So she goes to this college, and guess what? Nobody knows physics there either. So 